I'd like to welcome everyone online and everyone in the room to another edition of Codom X. Um, before we start, I'd like to ask you all to turn off your phone uh, or turn off the sound of your phone at least. Uh, if you have any questions, please keep them until the end. For the people online, you can leave your questions in the comments below. Um, and I will give the microphone to Lewis. He will introduce our next speaker for today. Thank you. Yes, today we're going to learn a little bit more about IoT, which is actually without, you might not realize it, but it's already a huge part of our life. So it could be really interesting to learn a little bit more about that. And today to tell us a bit more about that is Jordi Rulof. So please give him a round of applause. Hi. So, yeah, I was asked to tell you all something about IoT. So that's what we are going to do. Wait, okay, no, it's correct. So, yeah. Um, First off, the content of the presentation. Um, don't be scared, it will be 40 minutes long. It's an introduction. Uh, what, why, and who is IoT? And then next part, the cases we do at, uh, at Actions, the company I work for. Um, at first, I'm gonna explain a little bit about the setup of the, of the presentation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna discuss something like, for example, what is a developer in this case? And we all know we're professional Stack Overflow searchers. The rule of thumb is, if we don't have it on Stack Overflow, we're out of luck. We love our vitamins, and it's really a stereotype, but we love our pizza. And then next part, our clients mainly see us as a bunch of, that's right, key users. And uh, I'm sorry, it was a joke, because they actually think we're all wizards, and they're really happy with what we do, but they don't know how. Um, so this is going to be the setup of the presentation. Um, I'm more of a visual guy. The introduction. Yeah, like I explained. Um, for me, I'm Jordi, Jordi Rulos. I work at Axions. Uh, I have eight years of experience, most in front and user experience. Um, so I really like the visual stuff of an application, uh, like it says, UX developer. And I'm currently active in two big IoT projects. I'm gonna explain something more about them in the cases. And every presentation, I like to post a picture of me, um, what my current developer phase is, and that's this one. I really like new stuff. So I really like the newest frameworks, and my team doesn't, but I do. So they have to live with that. Axions, um, we're mostly about happy people. Um, you can do whatever you want within certain guidelines. And um, just do what makes you happy. We have the philosophy that um, if you do something that you like, uh, you actually do it well enough. So we try to, we try to how do you call that, support that. Um, on a high level, but also on a lower level, we have really um, different disciplines. So we have embedded um, UX development, project managers, but also on high level, Axions is split up between business units. So whenever something with a networking question comes or a net networking project, we can actually say like, hey, we have a business unit that can actually do that thing. Um, but for IoT, my business unit is, uh, is mostly the main player. And we're all about growth, personal growth, um, when you start Axions, you can choose to do a young, def young professional program, program. So that means just besides developing, you can also present yourself to clients, uh, discuss projects, and stuff like that. So now that marketing turned off, I think, on the live stream, I can actually talk about what is IoT. Um, and you hear a lot of things about IoT. I mean, you look up at Twitter, and the last part I saw was, IoT saved my cat. I think it was a joke. It can actually happen, but there, IoT is a buzzword. But to, to literally understand it, we have to dissect the subject. So first off, we're going to explain. Oh, wait. OK, it's wrong order. No problem. Um, when you search up at Google, the first thing is Wikipedia, of course. And everybody knows that's really factual. Um, they just describe, yeah, it's things that, that connect without human interaction. Thanks, Wikipedia. Then another one, we have Urban Dictionary, and that's a bit more precise because it literally means physical objects with internet capabilities. Yeah, but I mean physical objects, can it be animals or stuff like that? It can, but okay. And then we at Axions have the one, a system of devices that use an extensive network of sensors and connections to provide data to end users and therefore help with optimizing processes, workflow, security, and revenue. Every company is about revenue, but it's most part about optimizing processes and the workflow. So like I said, we need to dissect the subject. So in the Internet of Things, of course, the first part is Internet. And at first, it's a place where we share things. So we share discussions with each other. We share our opinions and without completely blaming total strangers. And we show what we like. 
Um, it's a place where we capture our lives, where we post imported images, and that means 90% of the visual content on the internet is about our cats, our kitten, kittens. And then next up, it's a place where we share our, uh, where we share the latest news based solely on facts, and they do things with our privacy, and we exactly know what they do on these platforms. But now more to the serious part, and that is, what are those things? Well, I can be pretty bland about it because it's everything. I mean, everything can be connected if you want to. For example, some bigger things like buildings, vehicles, airplanes, boats, doesn't matter. It can all be connected and share data to the internet. It can be closer to you, like refrigerator, ovens, um, cars, your phone, your phone is mostly part, um, your TV, um, even like the scratching pole from your cat. You can even connect that one. <laughs> And then even living things, cows, cats, again cats, humans. Uh, we had a project about NFC tags in, in a cow's ear that whenever we walked past the gate, we knew like, hey, what age he is, uh, what name. Uh, the last day he, he, was, he, um, he, he arrived at the farm and stuff like that. So literally everything can be directly contacted to the internet or indirectly. And this is a slide that just mainly shows all those things. I mean, there are a lot of things. And I still don't know why the dogs and the power plant on the left side are connected like that. But oh well, <laughs> those are the things that we can connect. Um, and now that we know that we can connect it, how do you connect it? Well, the first step in connecting it is literally making it smart. So imagine your water tap, you can make it smart, like put on a water sensor on it or a temperature sensor. And the next step, you want to actually connect that. Well, most of the sensors can actually connect directly to the internet through Bluetooth, um, how do you call that? Um, infrared and the internet itself and Wi-Fi. But uh, most of them don't. And that's where a gateway comes in. And the gateway is like literally just a huge ass router uh, where you can plug in your own OS, but also your own framework and that you can plug in your sensors and collect the data. So imagine you have a water tap and you measure pressure and temperature. Those are two different units, but you want them in the same format afterwards, JSON or anything like that. And that's where the gateway comes in. Um, it literally means, hey, we have a language, some unknown language, and we don't know if we can work with that, but we want it in a specific format. We convert it by placing our own framework on it. We had a framework in the port of Rotterdam called Claptrap, and that just literally translated all the data that came in, and then converts it to JSON. And here's an example of a message, the above one, MSG. That's a message that literally shows data with certain identifiers. Um, if we convert that, and it's code, I'm not going too deep into that because I'm a visual guy, but uh, as you can see, it gets converted here through the means of regex and stuff like that. But in the end, we get this, and it's the same thing but translate it. And this is what you want because this is actually the data that we use as a user on the platform, but also the systems on it. Next part is store it. So like on physical things, like the save icon, but the physical things like DVD, CD-ROMs, I mean, it's pretty retro, but be my guest. On your local server, you can have a local server farm in your basement. We don't judge, but you can actually store it there. And you all had a talk about the cloud. Uh, so I'm not going too deep into that, but you can store it on the cloud and you can actually do a lot more of that, but we're going to talk about it later. And then you have to connect it to things, so you have the data, you know the water pressure for example. What can you do with it? Well first off, remote control. And that's like the most amazing part, because actually you can lock your door um, over the internet, um, you can turn off cameras, stuff like that. You can monitor it, so you can actually say like, hey, this device that I plugged in, is it working correctly? And based on those, that data, we can actually do predictive things, predictive maintenance, for example, be the wizard that they actually think we are based on the data they share. Amazing. And it literally boils down to this. We've got things that get connected, we got data from those things, and then we hope to get insight. And that's where most of the, of the, of the revenue increase, but also in technological advances, are based, and that's on insight. And then again, why do we want that? So why do we want IoT? And I'm gonna speak at the note, nice. At first, I also inserted it into Google. And Forbes, you all know that I think, it's a magazine. 
The new rule for the future is going to be anything that can be connected will be connected. I mean, there are two certain things in life, and that's like the last season of Game of Thrones was a disaster, but also that everything can be connected. So that means everything that, that will be built later on has an internet connection or some means of connecting. The next up, Google, and we all know them. I want to try it. Hey, Google. Oh, damn. Uh, discover how efficiently your devices operate, manage global assets, blah, blah, blah. Exactly like, hey, we want to optimize stuff and we want to manage stuff. Google manages a lot. Google manages your data, even if you don't know it, but they manage and they use IoT to manage things. And then also Tech UK. Tech UK is a bit um, unknown, but they're, they are like an organization in the UK that comprises of 850 um, companies that all stand for innovation. They didn't vote in the Brexit, I think. That's why they stand for innovation. And they say it's, it offers us a new opportunity to be more efficient, to be more, uh, to save time. And we all want that as a developer and often emissions, but a pretty big thing in this century. We also did our own research. Um, and even the mouse is already in there. Nice. Okay, well, <laughs> it just explains on average, uh, on average, in the, in the main cities of, of the Netherlands, on average, every, uh, on average, 31% thinks that their company are behind the digitalizing or of, their, of their company. I mean, they have a lot of machines. Machine builds have a lot of machines, but a lot of those are not connected. So they sell them, and then it's just like blank. It's just radio silence. They don't know where they are. They don't know what they can do with it. They just sold it and done. And there can be a big optimizing in the, in the part. And that leads us to the previous scenario where we sold things and we reacted based on what those things told us. So for example, my car broke down, I'm gonna call a mechanic. I can't do it myself, but it's things and action. Well, it's last minute because I was in a traffic jam and stuff like that. So actually people need to come over, need to see if there's even space in the planning. And yeah, afterwards, we can optimize that. We can literally just, with the data I have, we can go to a situation where we've got things that, sell, that say us something, and if we've got multiple things with the same data, we can get insights from that, and then we can take action for it. So for example, if my car breaks down and five other owners have the same car with the same statistics, and like, hey, you started your car 20 times, it breaks down, let's send an engineer over at 15 times. Because then we can actually predict, like, hey, it's going to break, break down within a certain amount of time, so let's fix that. And it's way easier than to just do everything ad hoc and on the last moment. There's a little bit more behind that, as you can see, and we use that in Maestro. I'm going to talk about more of that a, bit, a little bit later. But to get those insights, we've got, for example, streaming analytics. Check the data. Um, is the data correct that we have it? Employ certain rules. We want some long time storage for that. So yeah, the data that we don't actively use, we must store it because we can base our insights later on that. Um, we can add rules like, hey, give an alert when something goes below a threshold. That all happens in the insights. And of course, we've got those things, like I said, the local gateways, the gateways connected to the sensors uh, from, cl from external clouds. And then afterwards, you've got action, business integration, and that's what Maestro is all about. So yeah, everything's also about the future with IoT. Like I said, everything will be connected, but that also means we can use that data for, for good things and also optimize our growth. So we can actually use that data to optimize workflows. Um, we had a project that, um, as simple as it sounds, in an elderly home, in a senior home, we had clothing for those people and they get washed like once a week. If you go there, you think longer, but oh well. Um, They've got tags in their clothes. And when they, when they get at the washing room, they actually get scanned. And those clothing gets put in certain bins that are closest to the people that wear them. Because they know the location of the people, the room, because a tag in the, in the, in the clothing tells us that. And that's amazing because we can even connect clothing. Um, it helps us with healthcare. We do a lot in healthcare. Um, with uh, machinery, check them on time, engineer, uh, maintenance, stuff like that. And yeah, of course, every company is about money, so we have increasing money, and everybody wants that, that hollow dollar. So who is exactly IoT? So 
uh, well, I can finish up the presentation and say, yeah, everybody, but that would be a bit, bit uh, abstract. I really like the quote because it literally says by a colleague of mine. And I think he was on drugs. But we have connectivity and device management. So you need a party that connects the literal things, the means of, of connecting um, those gateways. So, for example, um, you have a thing like the water tap, and it's not really connected. But you need a device for that. Yeah, you can make your own, but somebody already had it. And a company like Cisco provides the gateways for that. So that literally means the physical things to connect your stuff. Like I said, the device itself, they also, they also need to be managed. So imagine you have like 200 sensors in a project. Yeah, you also want to manage that. You, have, you need an IoT platform for that because they are connected to the internet, but you also want to maintain them on site. I mean, we had gateways on the port of Rotterdam that are like below water. I don't want to go there. So we have to do it remotely. You can update it remotely, but you need a platform for that. And there are certain providers for that. And like I said, again, the gateway. That brings us to this part of, of, the, of, the, of the chain, and that's edge computing. Be as close as possible to the sensor that's, that gets its data. That means less latency if you place it closer, and also more maintainability, because you don't have to travel for the sensor and like 20 miles further for the gateway. Um, you really want to go there. Uh, next up. Yeah. Um, and then another party in that whole chain is the cloud providers. And we've got IBM, Azure, Google, Amazon, um, and they all provide data storage, but a lot more. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit that later on, but they offer containerized applications. They, be, they, um, they supply you with insights platforms, so streaming analytics on IBM. Um, they can actually do long-term storage for you. You can actually use the cloud their services to do your insights, write rules on the data that you get. And then afterwards, like I said, you can containerize your application. And maybe that's a bit new, but the previous scenario, we had a lot of containerized application. So that may, literally means lift and shift. Oh my God. Um, but that literally means you have your own ecosystem, backend, frontend, middleware, stuff like that. And you can place it on every server that you want. But that means updating and upscaling all those things is a bit of a hassle or not optimized because when a certain feature gets used a lot, for example, uploading or watching videos, um, you want to upscale that per part to save your money. So what do you do? You go to microservices. And I think you all heard about microservices, I think. Oh my gosh, I can't tell everything. No, uh, no it, it literally means like, hey, we, um, we dissect our application and just like a good developer does with functions, we actually just dissect the application in those functions. So we've got an upload part, we've got an insights part, and then couple it loose from the main stuff and give access to that through a main API. That's also different, different microservices. So for example, if the upload function gets used a lot more than the video function, let's just upscale the, the, the upload function instead of the video function. And also updating is amazing because you can actually just update a little section of your application. Oh, it doesn't work, let's revert it and act like nothing happened. So this is another image that shows like, hey, we came from monolithics, um, application design, and we go to microservices. There's a con in that microservices tend to be a lot more, even though flexible, a lot more complicated. So you really need to know the system and the context from that. Another big thing of those things, <laughs> in the whole IoT chain is security. I mean, security is another buzzword that gets used a lot, um, but security is important in every section on the chain. You want your data security, but you also want your gateway security to only access it when you're on the VPN that's containerized on the gateway. You want passwords, basic authorization and authentication. And also maintain a bit or um, reliability. So look, I mean, our code never breaks, but when it does, we want, our, uh, we want a sort of kind of backup so we can literally just throw over the application to another part of the world and again, act like nothing happened, all within a click of a mouse button. And this is really out of context, but <laughs> the context with it is um, IBM, for example, the IBM Cloud offers a, 
a API connect. And that's literally your gateway from the cloud to the outside world. So for example, if you want to check your calls, um, somebody wants data from it, you can actually pass it through to API connect and say like, hey, what's the header within the validation? And you can invoke certain calls that you want before it actually arrives at the service that gets used. Um, so for example, um, I'm gonna show a bit later on on custom authentication. Um, but also, this can also be used between the microservices. But, so what if one service, and I mean it's a bit of an edge case, but if one service, you don't want to connect to other services, you want them really like isolated, you can actually just put an API connect layer on it and say, hey, you need a key and a token for it, and if you don't have it, you're out of luck, you can't get the data. And this shows a bit of a practical example of a booking project and then in validate, invoke it, map it, so you can actually map the data that you get all within one platform. And now we have a video because um, you also need an integrator for that. And I hope when I play next, it starts. You know what sucks? I'll tell you what sucks. IoT sucks. You've taken the steps to connect business critical assets to the internet. Look at you being in the forefront. You've taken your company into the future making more money, and creating happier customers. But as you're adding more IoT services, the simplicity goes right out the window. Each new one uses their own infrastructure with their own gateways, different operators, and cloud providers. The maintenance cost increases exponentially with every new service added. And what if your operator gets hacked? Or if there's a bug in one of the protocols? Or your cloud provider goes down? Do you even know where to start troubleshooting? You guessed it. That's why IoT sucks. And we're here to unsuck it. We give you a simple dashboard that brings order to this chaos. Update, patch, and switch with ease. Oh, and if you want to connect your legacy equipment, you can do so as easy as this. I'm not kidding. That's how cheap and easy it can be. Let me show you again. It doesn't matter what industry you're in or what devices you're using. We take you from this to this. Not only that, but we make sure no vendor locks in your IT manager. You can easily switch vendors according to your current needs. That hurts. He's been in there for the last 15 years. So let's recap. We're cheaper, easier, and safer. No matter how many use cases you have, you can work within a single infrastructure. Not only that, but you own the data, so we won't even look at it if you don't want us to. And you can focus on all the added value that your IoT solutions provide to your customers. Sounds like a no-brainer, right? Now, I'm gonna be honest. If you're sure that you'll have only one IoT solution and that you'll keep it that way forever, then I suggest you go with one of our competitors. They're great for that. For all other purposes, So yeah, that's the integrated part. So Axians as a company just knows a lot about all those things in the, in the chain and then integrates that as a whole. Um, so again, this image, um, we, we tend to know a lot of things about things, connectivity, data, and insights, and we try to connect all those things. And then up to the cases um, and seeing the time, I also had a video of that, but I also want to show something. So. Ah, oh well, another video. Ooh. Stel je voor, de eerste zijde uit China. Kruiden uit India. Thee, rubber, suiker. Alle rijkdom van de wereld. For over 500 years, the lifeblood of commerce has flowed in and out of the port of Rotterdam. Today, it's on a scale and at a speed never before imagined. Until now. There is a lot at stake. 
We have vessels entering the dangerous cargo. We have very large container carriers. If one gets stuck in the entrance, the entire harbor is jammed. The consequences, safety-wise and economically, are immense if something goes wrong. The logistics are easy, but uh, to make the puzzle work, that is complicated. Making the puzzle work is a network of sensors spread across the port's 41 square miles, providing terabits of data. 200 calculations a minute. Wind, tides, currents, and visibility to help guide 130,000 ships a year and protect 468 million tons of cargo. In my function, in my job, the security is the main thing. If we have the right data and the reliability is proven, we can predict what the situation will be three, four, five hours in advance, and we can plan with that. After careful evaluation and planning, everything is, is possible in Rotterdam, and that's uh, the thing we are, we are proud of. The confidence to run Europe's largest port, and one company delivers all that sensor data safely, delivers all that data securely, between the storied past and a modern efficiency the Dutch would call overlooking, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. So yeah, there was a video about the port of Rotterdam with George R. R. Martin, if you all noticed it. But digitalization in the port of Rotterdam. Imagine the Port of Rotterdam, like they told you, they have a lot of assets. Living data, wind, temperature, stuff like that, and they need to manage that. Because when a boat arrives, you actually want to know, hey, can you actually go in the port, or is the water too low? And you want to optimize that. And in the future, there's a possibility, well, there's not a possibility, it's certain that there will be boats without a captain. And you somehow need to tell that boat, hey, you can arrive here. You can just scream at the boat and say no, because, hey, it's a computer. So you actually want all those sensors to tell you trustworthy data and do your decision based on that. So, like I said, living and static data, so containers, um, dynamic data like measurements, like water temperature, water height, visibility, um, you all want that in the platform to monitor it. So you actually want to see, like, hey, what happens here? Um, I'm going to show you a bit later on on the, on the plate where all the sensors are. Um, it literally boils down to this. We want to connect certain things in the harbor, even where the, uh, even where the ships tie their ropes. You want to connect those poles. You want to prepare the data, so on the gateway already. You want to analyze the data, so for example, on the cloud, do your insights on that. Um, provide more data, like checks on thresholds, and then visualize it in a, in a, in a dashboard. And that's what I really like about this section. Um, you can actually show all that data from one place or from all around the world into one dashboard and then decide and advise on that. So, like I said, you want to decide whether a boat can come in or not. Even with these storms of, of the past week, um, you don't want to get something like, oh, let the boat in and through the storm the visibility is too low. You can actually check that right now. And this uh, is like the, um, the architectural plate and I literally have told there, help me. So it's a lot. There's a lot of services in that, but it boils down to this. And that means we've got data on the up, upper hand and third parties on the lower hand, because Port of Rotterdam don't actually own all the sensors, but there are a lot of sensors that are already placed by, Rijkswa or by Rijkswaterstaat, the Rijksoverheid. So um, you want to combine that. You want the system to be accessible to them. Then we've got the hydrometeo part, so that's this section. And then afterwards, you've got an API interface that different parties can access that, even the boats and the operators. So they can send their data in, but they can also read their data and do their decisions based on that. And that means there's also a lot of security involved. It's really important to have your physical security, like with simple things like budget, but also those gateways that you can just plug in and hack the thing. No, you need some security. You need it certified. Are you hunting? Oh. <laughs> nice. Uh, um, and also reliability. So like I said, if something breaks in the middle of a storm, you want to be up and running as quick as possible. And we're not talking about, ah, we can do it an hour later. No, directly. So 
I'm going to tell you something more about that, but that just means disaster recovery. So with a click of a button, recover the disaster by just yeeting over the whole system to another place in the world. And it still boils down to this image, and that's like things, those sensors, visibility measurements, connect them, get the data from that, and do our insights by the way of monitoring, visualizing, or data checking. Um, I'm going to show a living demo. So these are like a couple of images for that. Um, this is actually that shows where the sensors are. Um, afterwards, after the second case, I'm going to talk. I'm going to show a little bit more. But here's literally the live data that operators can see and base their decision on it, including the mouse. And then we already talked a bit about the, the platform from Cisco, it's called Kinetic to manage the gateways. But we at Axion thought, why not a platform for everything that can be connected? So a platform for literally everything. And that's where we called it Maestro. And the case is that you have a lot of devices in the world. Our first client was Friado, that's, uh, that delivers, and I kid you not, the chicken, the chicken ovens for Walmart. It's a really simple thing, but imagine Friado selling those, and then just, yeah, when they break down, they call an engineer, but that's it. They actually make them smart, so you can manage them um, remotely, so you can actually just register where they are, uh, current status, sensor, stuff like that. Ah. And do your predictive maintenance. So when you get the data and you see like, hey, that oven door closed 20 times and at 21 it breaks, based on the previous data that we got, let's just send an engineer already over. It's more money from them and they keep the uptime really high. And updating. Imagine a scenario where you wake up on Monday and you have a schedule of like, okay, this week I need to update 3,000 devices. So you grab your USB stick, you walk over to the first store, you plug in your USB stick, and done. Also recipes. So one likes his chicken, the other one does not. <laughs> um, and then Friday you're like, oh, fine, I'm done. And then you find out that that's the wrong firmware. And the oven literally thinks it's a, it's a microwave or something like that. You can actually just remotely manage that and send over a file, the oven that implements that, and it's just updated with all new recipes. Again, the most. It literally, again, is those things, we want insights from them. So we want to actually see, hey, what happens with the ovens? What are the sensors doing? Somebody behind his desk wants to check that. And based on that, we want to create rules. Like, hey, when it's below a threshold, um, call the company, the maintenance company, and send an engineer over without even human interaction in the process. So those actions, in the future, those actions will be done by systems alone. Because if you implement the data correctly and you implement the insights on that and the streaming analytics and the checking, you can actually go through a, to an action-based system without human interaction. It's one of the examples where we use MISO, a smart city in Eindhoven to measure the air quality. And you can literally see on a map, like, hey, how safe is it here to live with the air quality? Um, but those things, normally they aren't connected, but we just plug a sensor on it and then we make it possible to actually get that data and do our insights on that and show it on a dashboard. And again, security and reliability. Um, so imagine all those devices also means a lot of different security issues. And you want to, um, how do you call that? You want to um, react on that. So you want certain specifications for the device and certain certifications on the physical objects. An, an oven operates differently than a sensor that measures air quality, but you want them secure. So you implement protocols on the sensor itself or on the gateway that's next to the device. And reliability. So you want the data to be reliable, you want to check it, you want to check whether it's okay. And if something happens, this is based on Azure, you want it from Germany or the UK, <laughs> in Australia, and then when everything works in the UK again or Germany, you can just transfer it over in like a click of a mouse button and within 15 minutes. This <laughs> shows a little bit about the system itself. Um, this is where the microservices part comes in, because there are a lot of groups here, Walmart and other companies that actually have their own ovens, but we want one system, and we don't want to have multiple lift and shift um, principles hanging on those companies. 
So we do a group authentication and authorization. So literally say like, hey, you can access the server as Walmart. This server is the top one. And another company can only connect to the other ones and have to buy more access or something like that. That also means we can upscale it really quickly. If Friado decides to plug in a thousand devices more, we can upscale one service and be done with it, if your code is correct. And we have another case, and I promised you a beer story in the opening talk. So we have a beer story, and we can even optimize your habit. Um, it's called optimize the workflow to getting drunk. <laughs> um, but imagine you have a beer tap. And you connect it to the internet. A sister company created a sensor that can actually just plug it into the beer tab and sends data like, hey, it's empty like this. Um, so the bar in an old situation, the bar just calls a different beer brand and says like, hey, I need beer. I don't care how much, I want a much. Okay, so they deliver it and done. And then the next time when it's almost empty, they call again. But what if you can actually foresee that? So you know like, hey, last year on this date, there was a lot of beer flowing out. So let's just already um, call the company and say, hey, come here with your beer. Um, that also means you can move to a subscriptions-based um, beer model. <laughs> it's like um, the company can just promise you that you get your beer on certain times if they have the access to the data. So they can see in the, in the database like, hey, on Monday this bar sold a lot of beer. How about we send them an email and deliver this amount of beer really precisely on the next Monday, so they never run out. It's amazing, because we have a lot of happy people and happy students afterwards. So that's another case of IoT with really simple things, everyday things, I think everyday things, connected to the internet. And now I'm gonna show you a bit uh, about the demo, and you know demos tend to be a little bit more dangerously. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm not falling into that. Uh, let me see, can I just exit the... Come on. Wait a second, I need to... Ah. No, it duplicates my screen, but here we have it. And when we go to the... Uh, Wait a second, I need to check it. Public. <laughs> Where the time? Oh wait, I don't even have internet. What's the... Help. Yeah, Wi-Fi. Yeah, I just want to show you the dashboard that's literally live data from the port of Rotterdam right now. I don't have waiting music, so... And I'm not gonna sing, so you just have to wait. <laughs> nice. Everybody on the live stream is like, nice, free Wi-Fi for the next year. <laughs> so here we have the public dashboard of the Port of Rotterdam. And... Wait a sec. It loads a bit, a bit slow. And this is live data from the port of Rotterdam. So you can actually see, you can resize it, it works on mobile, stuff like that. But actually, those are all the sensors um, that we placed, and then we get data from it. And last storm, everything was red. And that was correct, because we wanted to show, like, hey, the visibility is too low, or the wind, uh, the wind speed is too high. Um, you can even do your astrological data on it, so you can actually plan ahead for a year, because they collected a lot of data from the past years, and say like, hey, in the future, it's gonna go something about that. And you see the yellow line here, and it actually moves along nicely with it. A bit of a mark because of the storm, but there you have it, this is a, a really big, application of the IOC, so connecting sensors and showing the data. And there are people in a high tower next to the Erasmusbrug deciding, hey, this boat can come in or not based on this dashboard. And it's amazing to see that work and that you can actually code this thing and then thousands of people use that. So that's actually pretty awesome. 
Um, I also saw another image, I showed another image, but that's for internal use, but that's uploading files, uh, checking sensors, whether they are correct or stuff like that. Operators that, that, um, that uh, how do you call it, that manage the boats don't actually need to know if the sensor works, they just want to let the, or they want to know that the sensor works and the people behind that have to check if the sensor works. So there's two different sections of that. So yeah, and then we have Maestro, just to show you a bit of the diversity of the application. Here we have it. Oh. Yeah, I just wanted to show this image now, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's gonna go fine, I promise you. Nice, it doesn't go well, like I said. You know what, I'm gonna ask LastPass, like, hey, do you know that? Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually really proud of this because <laughs> I created this. <laughs> yeah, so here you can see an overview of the map um, where all those different devices are managed and those can be ovens, sensors, it doesn't matter. Um, and when you click on that, based on the role I'm in, and I'm admin right now, I can go to, for example, Hamburg and show data on it. Um, for example, in this case, it's temperature and the motor engine of the oven. So how does that work? We can do average, averages on that. So we can check like, hey, what are the average of those? And there's somebody, an engineer who thinks like, hey, is this correct or not? But on the other side of this, of this thing, we've got one in, in Eindhoven, and that's also an IT project, but not ovens, but, wow, the internet is a bit, here we go. Uh. Damn. Yeah, there's a lot of, rope. yeah, I want to show that a bit later on. Uh. Ah, here we are. There's a different group of devices, a floor, literally a floor in a building, where we can show the average temperature or, or how busy it is in a room. And this is live data, so we can actually say like, hey, they don't work a lot at Eindhoven, I think. But you can actually go to the room ups upstairs and sit there because it's really empty. And then when somebody goes sits there, it just updates and says, hey, maybe you should choose a different room. Um, let me see if that's... No, it's a 404. Too bad. No, um, but you can click through the floors, show data more precisely on the meters and stuff like that. So it literally means one platform. It's one base of code for multiple kinds of sensors. And then we have another example of based on user authentication and... Um, roles, and that's on Lopez. It's the same code that runs in the background, the same UI, but it's a whole different theme and a whole different sidebar with, with menu items based on roles and permissions. And I don't know if a lot of people will do front-end development, but you all know styling is compiled and then transferred over to the application. And we found a way to actually just dynamically apply styling, so have it in a database and compile it on runtime. So that means we can, per user, compile a different team and even place the side menu on the right side or the top bar in the footer, stuff like that. And then on Lopez, And here we've got um, we have a device, and that's literally a robot arm that gets things out of a, out of a magazine, uh, a magazine uh, storage, and then just places it on the right card. And on this thing, you can see the location, well, the time, the status, and the uptime. But here we have literally the controls. So we can actually say, hey, move your arm over, pick position one, stuff like that. And we can all do that from our home and don't have to actually be in Luxembourg to do that. 
Um, and this is only for one device, but imagine having hundreds of devices with the same platform. And that's what IoT can do for us if we use the data correctly. And that's about it, I think. And exactly on time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so we're going to do some questions right now. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question. We have a catch box that Liu has. He's going to throw it to you. Uh, please cash it. Uh, and you can have a, you can answer some questions. Oh, I had a question, by the way, as well. Can I throw? Uh, you can throw the catch box if you want to. <laughs> oh, my God. It's going to be amazing. Catch it. Yeah, they promised me a microphone. And I thought, like, hey, those, all those years of SingStar. Uh, I, had a, I, had a, I had a first question. I all saw right. that you guys also did something with uh, artificial intelligence. And also a question about your internships at the company that you work for. Do you have any uh, knowledge about that? And yeah, do but, you have also uh, internships? Um, well, I think positions. a lot of more people want to know that. Yeah, we always, like most of the time, have position for that. And like I said, we have different business units. So in Amsterdam, we have a business unit based on, uh, for example, marketing. But we in Capella and the IJssel near Rotterdam, we do IoT. We have another one in, in um, in Capella that does um, yeah, data sharing. So we literally just send people off to different projects. We have one in Eindhoven with networking. So we have all kinds of different sections. So there's always a possibility to do an internship at Axians, but a different business unit. So for example, you can do it in, in Capella, but if there's a different subject that you like more, like networking, God forbid, you can go there. So yeah, it, there's always a possibility for that. And cool. also AI, but I think that's Bevo Wijk. But I don't know for sure. I have to look that up. All right. Good to know. Thank you. So any questions? First one. You can throw it to him. No, I'm going to be generous. <laughs> yeah, I'm so need it to his face, and that's not fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Um, I was wondering um, what kind of stuff do you have yourself at home? And are you not scared about companies, uh, big companies, using your data that you provide them? Yeah for other stuff? Yeah, that's a really tricky question because I'm like the most easygoing guy as it comes with data. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, everything gets connected. And I kind of like measure it like, hey, do I want the hassle to turn everything off, check everything and read the license agreement that you all don't do, I know, um, or just accept it and place my trust in companies. That's a bit, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a difficult decision, but for me, it can literally just optimize my life by just connecting things. I can sit at my work and think, oh my God, it's cold and my kitten is really freezing, so let's just turn the heater on. Um, I can start already some music when I arrive at my door, stuff like that. So it really makes my life better. And yeah, you always have privacy concerns, but I'm also really trust, I'm, I'm trusting in the rules, even the GDPR stuff. Because, yeah, that just sets different boundaries. Um, and there's always a danger, of course, but that danger is so minimal in my vision that I'm like, please use it because you can optimize my living. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Great. Uh, hey, thanks for the talk, first of all. Um, I was wondering how uh, 5G will that change sort of how you do things or uh, will it have a big um, impact? Well, I'm going to be really bland about it. No, uh, maybe in speed, but if you implement it correctly, the system, it can already work with the newest technology. Um, of course, there always have to be some changes in your code, like on the gateway specific, but data is data. And if it gets sent in a different, uh, different um, format, you can actually plug it in on the gateway and change things there. But um, if it's a change in speed, it doesn't matter. You can even scale down the microservices if you want, if you use them. So it only makes it better in our case. Um, but I mean, there are a lot of IoT projects that like literally hard coded. Yeah, they're going to have a problem. But in this case, we don't. It's all about how you make your own system. That's like the core thing. I mean, the core thing of this are developers. So yeah. Any more questions? Okay. 
Jesus. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you showed a lot of cool projects you've worked on as well, and and then start a little bit more basic stuff as well. And I was wondering, um, are there any um, easy ways to to start experimenting with how, what it's like to work with IoT and yeah. maybe build small apps or yeah, um, um, what we could use? Yeah, of course. I'm pretty hyped about that. You have Arduinos, stuff like that. Um, your 3D printer, if you have one, you can literally connect everything to the internet. So buy a sensor of AliExpress or something, plug it in and find your own way. There are a lot of cool materials online. Um, Microsoft has a lot of free um, stuff from IoT because Microsoft is really pressuring in the IoT. Um, so look that up. Um, start searching down that rabbit hole of all the things that get connected. Find out cases. Um, we even do a workshop at Axions by just literally within one hour, you have a device that sends its data and you can actually remotely control that on the dashboard on mass. Um, but there's a lot of different sections in the whole IoT chain. So if you want to check on data, do data analytics. If you want to check on the visual stuff, talk a lot and be a UX developer. I mean, it's as simple as that. It's as complicated as you want it to be yourself, but you can do really cool things with that. And I think you have a lot of possibility on this school to check into IoT, and we all do something with IoT indirectly, so why not? Thanks. Anyone else? All right. Thank you so much, Judy, for being here. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Give him a warm applause. <laughs> and we hope to see you all next week during the next Coin on X talk.